Bill Dwight. I'm uh, the chair of, of this committee here, Legislative Matters, tonight. I just did it. Uh, we're gonna, can someone close that door, please? Uh, um, we're going to be discussing zoning, uh, the uh, ma uh, marijuana retail zoning, of course, that will be coming up first on the agenda, then after that will be uh, taxi licensing, if, if you're trying to schedule the rest of your evening. Um, be sure to stay tuned for that. Um, before we convene, and I know that uh, you've done this already once, and I'm sure you wouldn't have a problem doing it again, but I'd like to take a moment and uh, of silence to reflect on the most recent loss of our representative, Peter Kokot, mm -hmm. and just leave it at that. I'll just call for a moment of silence, please. Thank you very much. Um, just to let folks know, I believe the camera is still rolling, so that this meeting will be recorded visually and audio with you, if that's a word, um, for your informed consent. Um, Laura, would you please call the roll of the Legislative Matters Committee? Sure. Councilor Dwight. Mm -hmm. Here. Councilor Here. Okay, we are all here, so we have a quorum and we are convened. I, I'm going to try and do this a little differently, I think. Um, rather than an upfront public comment, what I will do is actually accept public comment without limitation on time, but just please be mindful as, of time uh, as, we, as we go through the items. That way you can speak directly to the specific items and your concerns relative to those. Um, as I said, this is zoning. Uh, that's all we'll be discussing tonight, the zoning for marijuana retail. Um, some of the other issues that came up in the previous forum um, will be addressed either on the council floor or in other committee meetings. But this, so we want to stay on what's on the agenda, given the fact that that's what we're required to do by law, by open meeting law, is stick to the items on the agenda. So, okay. So first, um, um, is there a, a motion to accept the minutes from our meeting of February 12th? Mm -hmm. Any discussion on that? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, by the way, and I think, okay, before we proceed, I want to introduce uh, Councilor Carney, Councilor Klein, Councilor Murphy, City Solicitor Alan Seawall is here also, and Laura's going to keep us all in check in. Fine fellow, and just keep us keep the balloon from spinning around the room, basically. So, um, so this is this is the uh, public hearing, and this and I'll read you the public hearing notice. Um, this is Northampton public hearings, Tuesday, February 27, 2018, of the City Council on Legislative Matters on the Council Chambers, 212 Main Street, at 7 p.m. Proposed zoning ordinance amendments. And this is regulations for the sale and production of marijuana, including clarification of definitions. Amend the tables in uh, general business, entryway business, highway business, central business to allow retail sales. Amend 350-9.3 to prohibit the conversion or of non-conforming commercial uses to retail marijuana sales. Uh, four, specify outdoor growing, not sales allowed in rural residential, suburban residential, uh, water uh, supply protection regions and special conservancy districts and also to reformat the table of use for uh, general industrial uh, with uh, attachment 15 including expanding allowed uses to include industrial warehousing uh, clarifying language regarding uh, solar vo photovoltaic uh, clarifying marijuana production not sales for medicinal and retail purposes is allowed also, C, to reformat the table of use of, uh, of what is OI? It's industrial, oh, office industrial, thank you. Uh, attachment number, thank you, 16, including expanding allowed uses for a restaurant residential above the first floor for buildings older than 1939. 
eliminating uh, eliminate parking requirements for the reuse of buildings older than uh, 1939, clarify marijuana production, not sales for medicinal and retail purposes, allowed, <coughs> and allow commercial storage as principal use. Um, so there we go. That's the lay of that land. So, as um, I would ask that someone put this on the floor so that we can address the items as they're, as they're listed and then I will ask Carolyn to basically give us a walkthrough of the planning board's thoughts, the mayor's thoughts, and how what's, what's the best way to proceed. So, the motion puts this on the floor. Do we need to look so yes, thank you. That's what I yeah, that's what I'm shooting for. So open a public yeah, second. Public hearing. Okay. All those in favor of opening the public hearing, please say aye. Aye. Okay. We're there. Uh, now, and I'm going to actually refer to you. Um, process traditionally for a public hearing, we hear from proponents, opponents, and other and, and neutral testimony as well. Right? However, you. The chair, which is the, the structure, if there's no okay, so I have some to do that. Yeah, absolutely. As long as everyone has a fair opportunity to be heard. Okay. <coughs> well, first, let's hear what the city's plan is. Then we'll hear from uh, opponents, and then we'll end opponents and, or people with neutral thoughts on that. So, Carolyn, you want to walk us through? Sure. <coughs> Good evening. Thank you. Um, so before, there was one other item that I wasn't, I didn't catch. I don't know if you opened it. Was also a change to the highway business district table, and I just that's a part of this. Um, yeah, I mentioned that. That's on number did? two, okay. G B E B H B C B. I actually decided to use the words because everyone would just <laughs> not understand what the hell is going on. So, right. so I would like to go through. Um, and give an overview and a little bit of detail about the whole package of zoning in front of you, and then whatever um, you know, fine detail you want to go through. If you feel like you need to read certain parts of the text, then I think Laura can put that on the screen as well. But I figured I'd just go through the entire package to show how everything is sort of tied together. Um, so if Laura could put that up, that would be great. So, um, so if you could go back to slide one. Um, so um, these proposed zoning ordinances that are in front of you um, deal with land use regulations, um, addressing the changes in the marijuana um, legislation. Um, and other commercial districts, but also there's some other um, refinements of the commercial districts that are not necessarily related to the retail uh, marijuana component. So I just want to run through those. Oops. So first, we'll go through marijuana retail sales. Um, it is slow. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I'll hold the mouse up. Um, so the idea is that we we already have regulations that address um, uh, medical marijuana um, dispensaries and production. So we need to add. Um, components relative to the retail um, sales. So we need to amend our current definitions in the zoning. Um, we also need to amend the commercial districts to specify that retail sales are allowed um, in order to um, direct where we want those to happen. If we didn't do anything, um, they would just be treated simply like a retail use and be used or um, operate in any district in which um, retail is allowed. The zoning, the zoning proposal narrows it to um, four core districts. Um, it also establishes a buffer zone um, to match what's already um, been codified for the medical um, dispensaries. And also there's a proposed um, 
amendment that would specifically prohibit the conversion of non-conforming commercial uses to this retail function. So I'll go through that in detail a bit. So for the definitions, we have to sort of establish a definition for the medical, um, retail, and production side for uh, marijuana. Um, so in terms of production, it's currently allowed in the general industrial districts by right, unless you're creating a new building, which would trigger site plan review by the planning board. It's also allowed in um, office industrial, in the office industrial district, um, unless, uh, again, new construction would trigger a planning board review. In terms of outdoor cultivation, what's proposed um, is to allow um, cultivation outdoors if it's licensed by the state um, in the water supply protection, special conservancy, rural residential, and suburban residential. So it's basically everything outside that red hatched area it, it falls into one of those four zones. But if you, I don't know how well you can see that from um, behind me, but a lot of that is already built out as neighborhoods. So it's not necessarily indicating that the entire, you know, the majority of the city is available for cultivation, but anywhere where there are um, agricultural fields, essentially, or, or enough area to grow, that could be potentially approved. Um, by site plan, uh, the idea is to really regulate for outdoor cultivation, what is it? Well, what does the security look like? How does it feel? How does it present itself to the public? So that's what the site plan review process would be established to address. Oops. Um, so for retail sales, the core, four core commercial <coughs> districts that we're talking about are, um, in the proposed ordinance would be central business, entrance business, general business, and highway business. This is a map showing um, where those um, locations are in purple. I'm just going to try to get a highlighter on here. Um, oh, that didn't work. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the purple areas are the um, commercial districts. Um, so basically the King Street corridor down into Main Street um, downtown, and then south of Main Street along Pleasant Street, and then there's an area of general business that's Florence Center. Uh, there's a little bit of highway business district out in Leeds at the intersection of um, Mulberry and uh, Florence, Florence mm -hmm. Street and Boulder. Route 9. Um, so the green circles there show what we'll, I'll get into um, are 200 foot buffers around existing schools. So this map shows that all of those circles except for the Hampshire Educational Collaborative which is on Pleasant Street already, um, all of the um, core commercial districts are really outside the 200 foot buffer of all the existing schools in the city. So where retail sales would be prohibited would be not within 200 feet of a K through 12 establishment. Um, that's the same as what's uh, currently on the books for um, medical um, dispensaries in Northampton. Um, they wouldn't be allowed in any residential districts. They wouldn't be allowed in pre-existing non-conforming buildings, as I mentioned previously. Um, so these are examples of places, you know, on Elm Street, there's a medical office building, but the district is zoned residential. So just because it's non-conforming, in most circumstances, if you have a non-conforming use in a district, you can go to the zoning board and request relief to change to another non-conforming use. The proposed regulations say that for this particular retail use, you couldn't even approach the zoning board to ask for that change. And the idea is that the impacts, you know, would we're going to assume that for various reasons, the impacts in residential districts would, would be substantially more detrimental to that district on its face. So um, we're just sort of cutting that out of an option um, from the beginning. 
and of course not allowed in any non-retail districts, so not in the industrial districts or medical districts. You hit next to me again. <laughs> I hit the wrong button. Thanks. Um, so moving a little bit more into the other um, zoning changes in the packet, um, the changes to the office industrial table is really about um, initially sort of reformatting the table of uses so it looks and functions like the other tables that we have slowly been <coughs> amending over time. Um, move marijuana production from the definition section, which is where it is right now, into the actual table of use so that when you go to that table, you see that, you know, that, that use is allowed. Um, allow flexibility for new residential uses above the first floor in this district. We currently only allow live work as a component in the office industrial, which means you actually have to work in the building if you want to also live there. And it's really not been enforceable um, on, the, on the one hand, on the other hand, we also want to allow um, more opportunities to reuse the old uh, mill buildings. So these are buildings predating, you know, built before 1939, um, to allow opportunities for reinvestment and reuse, and I just had it a little bit easier um, from that perspective. Um, also, I'll introduce the allowance for restaurants and um, some small retail and entertainment in these old buildings. Um, again, to sort of facilitate the reuse and regeneration of those, those buildings. Right now, that's not allowed at all. Um, reduce the parking requirements for the reuse of these buildings. Typically, the planning board had a big discussion about this item. Um, they were concerned that there might be some spillover into neighborhoods if there was a demand for parking that wasn't met on site. On the other hand, many of the buildings that are in Northampton that would be affected by this have lots of parking. You can see the Yankee machine shop, there's already parking there. So it's not that these buildings don't have any parking, but it mirrors what's allowed uh, or what we allow in the central business district as well as the general business district in that we don't require the recalculation of parking for the reuse of an existing building. Footprint expansions, we do require um, a tabulation of how much more parking would be needed for that square footage that's added, but not for the reuse of existing buildings. So this isn't something new in Northampton, but it would be new for this industrial district for these older buildings. Uh, and then, um, this is a change as well to allow retail self-storage, which is just sort of, you know, those big storage bins that you can drive in and dump your extra stuff that you can't store in your house. Um, it's currently only allowed in the highway business district. Um, and uh, the proposal, which is the other piece of the package at the, um, at the end of the presentation, is to take it out of highway business, which, which is the only district in which it's allowed now, and move it over to office industrial, because it functions more like um, an industrial kind of building. And then um, eliminate the special permit requirements for solar arrays in the OI district. Um, for changes to the general industrial table, they somewhat mirror the office industrial in that um, we need to reformat the table and move produ marijuana production out of the definitions into um, the table of use. Um, but we also don't have a separate um, industrial warehousing component in our industrial district. So this would be for, you know, a FedEx facility or some kind of shipping, um, other shipping facility, um, but still minimize it to 25,000 square feet. That's not necessarily a magic number, but we don't think that um, we would necessarily generate interest from, you know, 100,000 square foot shipping or um, storage facilities, but also um, it's sort of scaled to Northampton that um, we don't typically have those big industrial buildings anyway. And um, again, sort of um, clean up the uh, photovoltaic or solar panel um, array um, definition and allow it to um, eliminate the special permit for that. Um, and this is just a cleanup, eliminate the text regarding the reuse of historic churches and schools. 
there aren't actually any in the general industrial district, so we don't really need that language in there. And then finally, the last um, ordinance amendment that's in your package is, as I mentioned before, just um, eliminating the allowed um, use of retail stores in the highway business district because it's being moved to the office industrial. Um, okay. So as I said, what we'll do is we'll take these items as we go, um, one by one. But and um, actually, first, actually, I'll ask if there are public comments based on the general description that you've heard. And this encompasses a number of other zoning that's not specific to marijuana, of course. But I imagine most of you are here talking about marijuana and zoning transactions related to that. So, but. Um, if not, we'll just move. We'll just move up to the first item, um, and that's uh, eighteen point zero two seven. And this is uh, <coughs> an ordinance of the city of Northampton that being ordained by the city council of the city of Northampton to amend section two point one by adding and deleting the text as shown. And Laura will call that up there for you. Um, striking the word medical in front of marijuana. <laughs> And then saying marijuana, comma, and then adding medical after that. That's one. Medical Marijuana Treatment Center, or MMTC, and Registered Marijuana Dispensary, RMD, uh, defined and regulated by, and now striking Massachusetts general laws and adding uh, citation specific, um, ST uh, 2012, Chapter 369. And the Massachusetts Department of, which now adding public health instead of just health regulations, and adding also again citation specific 105 CMR uh, 725.00, um, along with any related land use controlled or contracted by the MT MMTC where marijuana may be present, and then striking from that. The paragraph that says <clears throat> medical marijuana is a subset of medical uses in medical dispensaries and is allowed in any facilities where new physicians' offices and new dispensaries and pharmacies may be located, but not locations where medical uses and dispensaries are allowed only as a pre existing non conforming use and for any growing or pers uh, processing without dispensaries in any industrial area. That language will be struck or is proposed, and adding to the adding will be marijuana production, marijuana cultivating, growing, and processing facilities where marijuana plants are grown and marijuana products are manufactured and or tested, but not where sales to consumers are made. And then I'll add, also adding marijuana retail. Any facility in which a marijuana retailer, as defined in 935 CMR 500.02, sells marijuana. Um, so, Carolyn, you want to speak to this specifically and sure. just describe what the essence of this is? Yeah, so the, um, again, so we need to, um, this is really leans, we don't want to duplicate the language in the, in the um, regulations or the statute, so it's really defining locally how we're going to, we're just going to call it out is the differences between the medical and the production and the retail side of it. Um, and again, the deletion of that tax is really because we're distributing in the use tables where those things are allowed. Um, any comments from out there? Yes, sir. Um, when, when you have a comment, please step up and identify yourself and give us your address for the record. Um, my name is Mike Cutler, and uh, I live on Mark Warner Drive in Northampton. I practice law uh, on Con Street. And uh, these are just some uh, lawyer's observations about the, some of the references. Uh, as of the end of this year, under the new uh, state law, the medical supervision is going to be moving from the DPH and from this uh, session law statute, uh, 2012, chapter 369. As of uh, 2019, medical dispensaries are going to come under the ambit of the Cannabis Control Commission. So you might want to, and, and, and uh, this session law is going to be repealed, 
and replaced with a new comprehensive medical marijuana law, Chapter 94I. So it might be worth referencing for continuity purposes uh, Chapter 94I of the general laws here for, for the medical licensing. And just for the purposes of referencing marijuana retailing in the new law, you might want to reference Chapter 94G of the general laws, which is the enabling legislation for 935 CMR 500. Uh, those Thank you for the important notes. Um, Alan, with, of course, the reason that we are now moving with this zoning with it, uh, under existing circumstances because um, applications will be accepted as of April 1st, and if we don't have the zoning in place, then they get to, um, they're basically have to abide by existing law, right? Existing okay. zoning. The citation, of course, as you noted, is not actually fact yet because the, but you're, I take your point, there will be the transition to uh, oversight from the Department right. of Public Health. And when that happens, we'll see Attorney Cutler back here as we have we'll make one. <laughs> 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 okay. Sorry. Well, it's good to see you again. That'd be great. <laughs> okay. So it, it, in your when you're thinking that it's appropriate to move with at least the existing agencies as they're identified now. Yeah. And as as the law changes, we're going to have to react to that, but I don't think it's appropriate to cite something that doesn't exist yet. Okay, okay. good point. Um, and, as, and if I may, um, I didn't see, and maybe I missed it, I didn't see a definition of retail marijuana in 94G. I did find it in, in the, Draft regulations. Well, uh, my, my suggestion might be then to, to stay in lockstep with the state is, is to add some language referencing a, a cannabis control commission licensed retail facility because it's it's the licensing. Correct. It, it, it's, it's a state like the uh, marijuana retail and all the actions of uh, all the tasks that are separately licensed from cultivation, manufacturing, mm -hmm. and retail uh, all happens somewhat simultaneously at a local and state level. It's actually not simultaneous. You have to have your local special permit and host review done before your state application is deemed complete, as I'm sure you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it's, it's, it just strikes me that, that you know, referencing the reg without the unrelated legislation is I mean, belt and suspenders and just right. my observation. Thank you. I was gonna ask about that, about the second piece. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Council Rome. Oh, good question. So essentially general industrial for Carolyn, the general industrial office industrial production, which is either cultivation or processing. So it's essentially the same for both of those. And it's the same for the rural zones as far as outdoor cultivation. Those are RRSR, watershed protection, special conservancy. Those are all the same requirements. Uh -huh. Um, I, I don't understand the question. The same. We don't have outdoor cultivation now in the. So this would be new for the water supply special conservation. But it's the same throughout all of those zones. Just cultivation. Just cultivation. No, yeah. no sales. No, 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 no other. No, no. But the cultivation, cultivation requirements are the same yeah. in RRSR watershed protection and special conservation. Yeah. Yeah. And on section three, the table um, has general business allowed in the neighborhood business medical uh, business park. No. Um, the, but uh, entryway business, highway business, central business is also, it's permitted allowed in those as well. Right, so the reason why, I mean, they're, they're set up differently, so it's, um, so some of them are grouped together as just, you know, to the e-code, this, this is how you have to change it here, and the other one is just because it's a different table set up. So. Mm -hmm. and, and then um, where you talk about non-conforming commercial uses that's the use table not the density table so non-conforming structure in a business zone is no problem right it's yeah, just it should be just the anomaly pre-existing non-conforming use uh retail building that's sitting on urb exactly so it's used okay good okay. carolyn uh hemp i think it's going to be allowed by right now so we're not talking about hemp is, is a it's a crop like potatoes at this point, right? Is, is, is that my understanding that there are? Um, I have not followed that. <laughs> um, this is really just to follow what's being controlled and licensed at the state. So in terms of, um, so if it's allowed and it's outside of the CCC's licensing process, then 
Yes, it would just be treated like any other. In fact, it's they're specifically ruled on um, that this um, marijuana production is not does not follow the same standards as right. agriculture and, and doesn't achieve the same exemption. So we haven't addressed. You know, it's very specific to this product. So as I understand it, that hemp is being treated like any other crop, benign crop, we'll call for lack of a better term, um, or so. In, so we'll be allowed to turn. It. Just to address the hemp issue, uh, although it's uh, a different use than, than psychoactive marijuana, to operate uh, as a hemp producer, uh, the session law that was passed uh, last uh, July by the legislature that amended the initiative created a new category for hemp and hemp marketing, but uh, the state uh, the Department of Agriculture uh, is license has to license you first. There's, I mean, the local okay, so stuff is, is is wide open, but uh, you have to have a state license. Uh, okay. To be a okay. Thank you for that. So it's, a, it's an agriculture license yes. for the CCC. Excellent. Okay. All right. Um, any other discussion on uh, item eighteen point zero two seven? Just want to sure. clarify one more thing. So, um, Council Murphy kind of jumped ahead to 18.0.33, correct? Mm -hmm. He jumped around. So, yes. Yes. we still have to hear from Carolyn about that one because right. I'm still kind of in the dark about the nitty gritty of it all. So, if we could stick to the one that we're working on just process wise, it would be very helpful, I think, to me and probably to the people okay. here in the audience. What? I can see we've lost some people already. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's a that's a good point. So this is this item is item 18.033. This is an ordinance relative to zoning of marijuana, of course. And uh, this one reads. This is an ordinance um, to specify that retail and medical marijuana dispensaries and sales locations do not qualify for a finding regarding changes to legally pre-existing not uses. Uh, the rationale is the medical and retail marijuana operations generate more short-term trips throughout any given day. Such high volume use can have substantial impacts within zoning districts where commercial uses generally and marijuana retail and medical uses specifically are not allowed. Further, the city intends to direct medical and retail marijuana establishments within four core commercial areas where impacts can be mitigated. And those four commercial, commercial districts also allow complementary uses whereby trips can be chained together to help offset high volume generation of such uses. And the ordinance reads, <coughs> this is an ordinance of the city of Northampton, of course, uh, section one, and then chapter 350-92, by adding and deleting the Texas shell. Uh, this zoning ordinance shall not uh, apply to, and this is the existing language, this ordinance shall not apply to structures or uses lawfully in existence or lawfully begun, or to a valid building or special permit issued before the first publication of notice of the public hearing of this chapter, or to any other exemptions in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, Subsection 6. The ordinance shall apply to any change or substantial extension of such use to a building or special permit issued after the first notice of said public hearing any reconstruction, extension, or structural change of any such structure. And any alteration of the structure begun after the first notice of said public hearing to provide for its use for a substantially different purpose or for the same purpose in a substantially different manner or to a substantially greater extent. The new language that's being added is notwithstanding the above, nothing in this section, <coughs> excuse me, shall be construed to allow a change of non-conforming use to a new non-conforming medical or retail use, a retail marijuana use. And then in section two, this is, <coughs> excuse me, subsection 350-9.3, this is change, extension, alteration of legally pre-existing non-conforming structures, uses, or lots. Legally pre-existing non-conforming structures, uses, or lots may be changed, extended, or altered as set forth below, and then the added to that is except as noted in 9.2a above. And if a use is not eligible under one subsection, proceed to the next subsection. Got it? 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> Carolyn, you want to translate, please? Oh, I thought <laughs> It, you know, it just um, says that although we do allow for change of non-conforming use from one to the other by going through the zoning board process, in this particular instance, medical or retail sales would not be allowed because of the impact <coughs> read in the preamble of that. Right. Uh, anyone out there want to speak, or anyone here interested in speaking? This is to amend the table of attachments 9, 10, 12 uh, under allowed uses as follows. Uh, all retail and then adding retail marijuana with a very big asterisk. Uh, wholesale and then now we go back to the original language wholesale and business sales and supply of goods and services. And the footnote is added, no establishment shall be located within 200 feet of a pre-existing public or private school providing education in kindergarten or any of grades one through 12. Building facades and property must be consistent with the character of the neighborhood, including such items as transparent storefront windows with a view into the interior of the building. Security measures must appear from the outside of the building to be consistent with the character of the neighborhood. And then the next section, uh, amend table of attachments 9, 10, 12 under allowed uses as a new line, medical marijuana. And then we go down to section three, and that's to amend attachment two of the table of use principal uses by adding a new entry as follows. Retail marijuana, uh, which I'll read the footnote now, of course. No establishment shall, uh, uh, I'm sorry, that's the, same, that's the same footnote as before. I'll spare you that. Um, general business, A, uh, let's see. Okay, so medical, and the mar medical marijuana site, and I'll need a, a definition of the site in A, I'm not sure what that means, so. Um, Carolyn, would you speak to that? So, um, this is the actual, where the um, uses are allowed, and they're spelled out in each of the districts. Um, so, in um, the, the formatting for the attachments 9, 10, and 12 are all similar, so those are grouped together. Um, and this creates the 200 foot buffer that I spoke about earlier. And then in terms of the attachment 2 for the um, retail and med medical site needs of site plan approval by planning board. So you can do that medical marijuana, but you still need to go through the uh, planning board process for that. Uh, part of that's related to the way these rules have come into being. So under the um, um, medical side, there, there's um, not the same um, taxing structure as for the retail. And so there's a concern about impacts, traffic impacts, and other impacts. Um, in particular, the site plan review for medical would address traffic mitigation requirements. Um, so we still want to make sure we're addressing that if any new medical um, marijuana dispensaries were licensed and interested in locating in the city. Discussion? Any comments? Council Klein? I guess I just want to ask about the, um, so for retail marijuana shops essentially, you're laying out here what the facades need to look like and the property needs to be consistent with the structures around it. Yeah. Um, so is that actually different from any other store, any other zoning for any other kind of retail establishment? Why is it laid out here in this particular manner? Um, because, so the only other place that we've used this kind of language <laughs> is for porn stock shops. And the idea is, you know, we don't want to put these in bad alleys where, you know, people, where they're, you know, even um, there aren't eyes on the street. And we don't want to create these boarded up windows right in the middle of downtown. 
So we want to continue to create to make sure that there's not a traction from that pedestrian um, scale or, or type of um, building that's in our downtowns. And if you, there are, you know, there are restrictions both on the porn side and on the sales for uh, medical marijuana about how you're presenting to the public and what you can and cannot display in your windows. So what we're saying is we don't, we're not saying you have to display what you're selling, but we want you to have a display window that says something and that doesn't function differently from the other retail establishments that are in those commercial districts. Cindy, do you want to, do you want to speak to this? Um, uh, just two questions. Maybe you can help Carolyn. Okay. Um, so 200 feet is the minimum established by the state. My question is one to 100, why not three? And help me out, is 200 feet from here to Forbes or is 200 feet from here to Starbucks? I just want a visual, anybody know? Um, well, if you want to pull up that map. Just here to Starbucks. Um, just yeah. 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 Um, Starbucks? Well, that might be more like 100 over to Starbucks. Okay, so maybe yeah. to okay. Woodstar. Well, it's probably more than 100 to Starbucks. But yeah. yeah, but okay. it's not. Uh, so the map is here. So that's a 200 foot ring around each of those schools. Um, so the 200 was also decided for the medical. We have to be the same as for medical. It was debated at that time when the medical ordinances were adopted. But I put this map together to show that even if you went to 300 or 400 or 500, it's not, it, you know, it's, you're still talking about mostly residential districts. The thing that it might affect would be, um, you know, the Hampshire Educational Collaborative, which is on um, Pleasant Street, which is right across from a liquor store now. There, and then maybe the um, Talbot's Plaza down on the end by, on Bridge Street, mm -hmm. because Bridge Street School um, is sort of on the other side of that district. Mm -hmm. So if you expanded it more than 200, then it would probably affect that. And that's, that may be the only one, maybe Syria's market might be affected. And is it a state law that we have got to do um, 200 feet for recreational? And it's not 200, it, well, we have medical established, same, so it yeah. has to be the same. It has to be the same, yeah. okay. Yeah. Now my second question is, is this the place where we say we only want 3.4, which is what the state said our minimum needs to be, or in this in this zoning, where, where do we say that? Where do we are, set are that? In cap? the zoning, you're asking Say about that. a cap. Yes. A retail cap. Yeah. Um, that actually is not. I don't know. I don't actually oh, see right where it actually comes up in the zoning. That I mean, where it will come up or be appropriate to to actually in, introduce that. That would have to be introduced as either uh, a, a new ordinance. Um, that um, it's not included in this package. It, it doesn't have to be, it could be in zoning, it doesn't have to be, because it's not necessarily um, a land use issue. It would probably be a general ordinance, city ordinance. Um, the state doesn't say you have to do 3.4, the state says that if you're a community that voted in favor mm -hmm. of it, that you can't reduce right. it less than 20% if you're going to institute there's that. There's a cap on number, but there's also density, and I think what would be more appropriate for zoning might be mm -hmm. density, so limiting a particular number of shops within a particular um, amount of feet. I don't know if that's what you were trying to get at, but that's it's a little bit different than the cap generally. But I think I, I fear that we keep talking about it, and in our forum we kept talking about it, and it doesn't seem to fit anywhere, so I will just put it up, put it out again, where does it fit? Well, it would, and I leave that to you. Yeah, it would be a separate city ordinance. As I said, it would have to be a separate city okay. ordinance introduced by council or by citizen petition as well. Okay. Um, so, for instance, at this point, it would be appropriate discussing uh, the amending the criteria for buffers on, right. on this particular okay. item. Um, you know, dimensions, who qualifies, mm -hmm. and so on. Okay. Um, yeah, just want to know where it was. Thank you. Okay. Any other thoughts, conversation on this? Sure. So, yeah, please step up because oh, sure. actually, because this yeah, is being recorded. So, it's, hi. Yeah. Sure. Um, my name is Patricia Malone, and I live on West Center Street in Florence. Um, I do have a request about the maps, which is a bit of an aside. They're hard to see online, 
I'm pretty sure it's up to my street in terms of like what is the, the suburban zone on um, Florence Center. Um, so that's an aside, but I'm also trying to understand we, we, that we're hamstrung. There's nothing you can do about the 200 feet. There's no power no. locally for, no, no. it has to be the same. Well, the two, we don't, <laughs> we don't have the, we can't reduce it from what I understand. We could, Right, we can't I mean, expand it, but it has to conform with the medical. They, they have to. It has to conform to the medical. You would have to go back and amend right. the buffer for the medical. Right. But you could so right. The way that it's pitched now is it has to match what medical is. So that's what you the know. But you'd have to points. come back through, re-advertise, and also amend the medical um, buffer. And there's only one way to characterize a buffer. A buffer is a buffer. We can't come up with another term or way of. Of defining it's defined this. in the okay. um, regulations. Got it. Yeah, I'd like to see it be more than 200 feet um, beyond schools because that's one of my major concerns. And I realize as a practical matter, there may not even be any commercially zoned areas except for that Talbot's Plaza, right? But um, that would be my preference as a citizen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, did you have a oh, oh, And actually, we got into it a little bit, but I can't think of. A, one of the schools that actually is in a commercial zone where it would be an allowed use, you right. know, right at, at that mm -hmm. 200 foot buffer. Right, that's why I put the map up. Yeah, that's it. Shows the boundary the yeah. schools are all in places where it, it wouldn't be zoned to allow one anyway. So, in that sense, the buffer is, or the space is all the way to a commercial zone, which is quite a ways. And how yeah. does the Heck Academy, how do we, does that mean that that area of Pleasant Street that's within 200 feet mm -hmm. would not? Right, you yeah, couldn't, right. That's like the only one, though, I think. Right. <coughs> um, so I know that some towns are like considering things like and, their. And, and, and oh, I'm sorry. Identify yourself before. Yeah, I'm sorry. So I'm Heather Warner. I live at um, 115 Pine Street in Florence, parent of teen boys. Um, and um, yeah, so I know that some towns, Amherst, um, um, I think East Hampton even, <laughs> um, but they're creating this buffer zone around a few other kinds of establishments. You know, like maybe we don't want something right next to or even 300 feet from Forbes Library or from the Academy of Music or from the new treatment center that's, you know, recovery center or, you know, I mean, I guess I'm just wondering if there are other types of places that we want to consider in Northampton. Um, personally, as a parent, I'm a little bit distressed about the fact that there are no caps and that any retail space downtown and in Florence and on King, I mean, really, it's almost like what, what isn't included in this zoning, um, you know, but especially downtown where my kids like to take the bus downtown and hang out a little bit and I'm pretty you know getting more and more wary of them doing that and um, I moved here because of good schools and you know um, and a really nice downtown a family friendly downtown so I'm hoping this isn't a pot destination type of thing where there's just unlimited not much regulation happening so I'd like to consider other places in the city that we wouldn't want to have pot shops right next door to does Spiffy have any data <clears throat> about the efficacy of buffer zones? Um, I don't have that right off the top of my head. Um, I mean, I'm here partly as a resident right now, but um, no, but okay. I would be happy to look that up. And, um, you know, I know that what we do know is that, you know, th that there's relationships to density and, um, you know, and even in small towns, like there, when you also drive up competition, you lower pricing and unlike alcohol marijuana doesn't have low cap on on low low pricing uh, where alcohol does and um, I think that once the pricing wars start then you find that people are a little more sloppy about checking IDs and that's what we see with alcohol and I know that the ABCC was out here in Northampton because there were four violations of over service of alcohol um, reported and um, repeat violations from certain four places and he the the Ted Mahoney said you know he thinks that like when you have that much density that that kind of lack of you know careful control can happen 
So that's a little anecdotal. I'll try to find you the evidence on yeah, the buffer if you zones. Yeah, if you could get, if you could supply yeah. us with, uh, and actually send it to the mayor's office, okay. um, um, data relative to the efficacy of, of particularly, not so much as zoning, because actually the impact that ultimately Buffer is achieving the goal that you want without basically kind of gaming a, a zoning regulation. I'm not looking to zone out marijuana. I just, just want to be clear constraint. about that, you know, okay. but just to be thoughtful about where we do want it and what impact that has on passersby and young children and, um, yeah. So, and, yeah, and so it's, it's related. I don't know that buffer zones can be completely separated from density, you know, and just a large number of, of Okay. Places. No, that's, that's fine. Yeah. Any, anything that would be helpful. Okay. Um, other comments about the buffer zones as they were defined here? Just make one, one point that's important to consider. Uh, under Chapter 40A, um, zoning districts have to be uniform. Now, the legislature has given us the authority to create buffers around schools K through 12, but just because there's a particular use in a particular place now uh, doesn't mean that you can zone around that particular use because it's not uniform in the district anymore. So I think we need to be really careful in our thinking about this not to violate the uniformity principle of zoning districts. Although many other communities have done it. So it may hold up. It may. But I'm, I just want to put try. that out there as a concern. <laughs> and just because other Communities have done it doesn't mean it's going to hold up, and I just want to be careful about that. That's I just want to put that out there. I'm not saying we can't do it. I'm just saying there's something we have to think about. Sure, come on up. I just want to make an observation about the, the buffer zones. Um, just a couple points. First of all, uh, we're comparing. Uh, I mean, I think it's fair to compare, and I'm also the father of a successful child, so I have some concerns for. Uh, drug use among adolescents and legalization is all about giving more control to child's access than prohibition and having a functioning available set of outlets is important uh, not only to uh, having, having tax regulated sales uh, but uh, also to generating revenue for the town and in looking at marijuana as a use I think it's fair to compare that and look at what we do with zoning with alcohol and tobacco relative to uh, the institutions we want to tech, protect and the, the children and other uh, delicate people that we want to be concerned about having access or being, uh, uh, seeing all these things. The other uh, point that I would make is that there's robust data, current data, in the mature uh, reform states that have legalized before us that show adolescent use is not increased and has been reduced in several of the mature states. So. Uh, as we consider these uh, issues, I think it's, it's, it's worth looking at these. We're, we're not doing this for the first time in the United States. There are four states that have preceded us and have some fairly robust data on the adolescent safety uh, impacts uh, of uh, these uh, legalized outlets. Thank you. Thoughts or comments? Sure. Go ahead. Oh. Go well, I just wanted to comment, this came up at the previous forum about the data. Um, I know that in um, Colorado, some of the data that is being um, published is statewide, but when you begin to look at those communities that have um, banned the sale of marijuana because they have that local control versus those communities where it's actually being sold, you see that there's an, an increase in use in those communities where, um, where it's actually like Anyone else? Okay. <clears throat> we'll move on to item 18.035. This is zoning of marijuana. Um, this one, as it loads up on Civic Plus, here we go. Uh, this is to a, under section one, this is to amend attachments 4, 5, 18, 24 under quote site plan approval required for the following quote, close quote add the following new bullet open outdoor marijuana cultivation all security fencing fencing that includes razor wire or other physical security measures that are not
not typically residential in character. It must be screened with vegetation so that it's not visible from the public ways, nor from other principal residential structures within 300 feet. If a fence or other security structure is planned within a FEMA mapped floodplain, it must be shown to be engineered to withstand expected wa uh, flood waters, or it must be engineered to include a breakaway that opens to flood conditions. <coughs> okay, well, this one's fairly straightforward, Callum, but <laughs> you want to enhance it a little bit? Um, yeah, I mentioned before, it's really just sort of how it looks in those districts that, the, that I think is important to address. Um, we don't know really how many of these, if there would be any interest in, in um, creating any of these. We had someone come in and ask about it, but you know, given that we're in New England, mm -hmm. probably get minimal. You know, I don't know if it would be competitive with an indoor facility, but um, uh, the idea is just it could also help make farm parcels more viable. Um, so we just wanted to allow that as an option. It specifies marijuana principally because obviously some people put a razor wire around their tomatoes as well. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, hi. <laughs> we can get you um, right I, next to I do get a little bit confused about this. Um, I think what you're saying is that outdoor growing of marijuana would be permitted in any sort of parcel that anything else could be grown on? Um, essentially, agricultural parcels. So, you know, it's sort of down by Main's Field or where the, you know, the, I'm not Main's Field, but like, yeah, any of those little places around Florence that, um, or Spring, Springfield, the new ball fields across from that where they have the community gardens, that could be a parcel. Um, I know that the regulations require like fencing, it can't be seen from the road, it can't be seen from the, you know, all these, these conditions and everything. And I'm just thinking like, that's going to be a horrendous eyesore of itself just to have it all blocked off. I mean, these are things that are not like little plants. They're like trunks that grow big, you know? So I'm just like, I guess I'm just, I'm feeling like it's a little loose. Like I think, so yes, those examples you raised are, I mean, those types of places, but um, Florence Fields and the, the agricultural fields beyond that would not be. Um, a candidate for this no, because they're like already if, protected. If the, if, the, but if the CSA went out of business, somebody could put up a pot place there. <laughs> mm, not for that, not in that particular location. It's probably more like, um, you know, in the meadows um, on the other side of, um, you know, the dike. There are lots of right. farm parcels there where the soil is good. And, you know, I think for because of the limited season, yeah. mm -hmm. you need a lot of land. From what I understand, <laughs> you need a lot of land mm -hmm. um, to make it viable. Mm -hmm. And there aren't that many large parcels really outside of the meadows. I guess um, I'm like thinking that there's also a lot of new language in the CCC regulation around craft growers and co-ops and co-op growing and that kind of thing. And so I think that there might be desire to open up smaller parcels and I guess I don't want to just guess who's going to come in I think it needs to be regulated you know like we should just say we, if we don't want small mini parcels everywhere let's not allow them you know let's limit it to a certain square footage of big big industrial type versus a bunch of little parcels that I don't know I just I, I Mm -hmm. And the intention of the ordinance wasn't to dictate what size or scale of operation, but to um, allow that as an option if someone felt like that might be an appropriate use of, an, of a parcel of land, but also make sure that visibly it doesn't intrude into the mm -hmm. neighborhood, which is why mm -hmm. site plan and not by right. Um, so that was really the key. So maybe we do want to look at growing outdoors in these districts, but we also want to make sure that visually it's not having a negative impact on the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Well, as you note, I mean, I mean we'll develop hybridization, indoor growing, hydroponics. Most cultivation in New England is probably going to be limited to indoors. There will be some outdoor. I mean, individuals can actually grow on their property. I, and I don't remember what the minimum plants were. Six. Six for an individual of 12 yeah. for a household. Um, and a window box. So 
Well, they, they have to be fenced in, according to the regulation. Or, or on the third floor or something. Right. Mm -hmm. So, comes a client. I'm just wondering about <clears throat> greenhouses and some of the properties and, you know, people wanting to put up security around their greenhouses and um, if that, this would apply to that as well. <clears throat> so if they put up fencing, it would need to be covered with vegetation even around something like a greenhouse. Like a large scale. You're talking about for, cult for this particular cultivation? Yeah. yeah, any kind of fencing. I mean, this is really outdoor cultivation, not within a greenhouse. And a greenhouse would be more like an industrial. I don't think for um, in buildings, you're not going to have fencing. And I mean, I guess you could, but I think it's going to be alarmed. I think you're not going to have windows. I think it's going to be much more of an industrial sized building. It's not just going to be a glass greenhouse because you know that and also that's not climate controlled as well as um, you know an indoor facility that has um, ventilation systems that you know address all of all the climate change issues inside one of those facilities so but nevertheless this is about sort of outdoor growing and the fencing related to it and the fencing that's mandated yeah the outdoor growing and the fencing that's currently mandated right and so it's, it's but again, we don't know if anybody would take this up as a, you know, would bother getting a license given that. Council uh, Carter. And also, <coughs> this uh, this ordinance really is about specifying that you need to have site plan approval yep. for any outside uh, right. outdoor cultivation, yeah. mm -hmm. right. not allowed by right. right. So you need to go. So okay, that's the gist of this. Mm -hmm. Comments on this. All right, moving on. <laughs> um, do, 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 that was, uh, this is item, <coughs> excuse me, 18.036. Um, this is about, to, <laughs> this is going to be really exciting for folks. This is amending the table of use. Um, and it's, it actually just strikes one item, but this is, um, this is under section one, this is to amend it, uh, the table in attachment 12, warehousing commercial storage as a principal use is struck. Carolyn. Um, <laughs> so um, it's given the evolution of our highway business districts to um, more uh, multi-access um, and multi-use by pedestrians and bicyclists and just Creating more of a landscape um, and aesthetic, a better aesthetic presentation to the city. These kinds of um, highway businesses may be no longer appropriate for these types of uses that are, have very um, limited day-to-day um, -day use and are really function more like an industrial kind of use. So taking it out of the highway business where we want to encourage other types of uses of business. Um. Does this become a problem in, in prime uh, real, uh, commercial real estate areas? I know that usually you see these storage places, they're sort of releg relegated to places like floodplains and tornado alleys and things like that. And then, then they kind of have to say that they have secure storage for your property. But, um, but the idea here is to take them out of essentially high, uh, you know, uh, zoning that would be appropriate for other other uh, more high volume systems, right. and then relocating into old older structures that uh, that were designed as warehouses, or brand new just pop up, <laughs> you pop know, up retail, like on <laughs> Route Ten. You know, you have like, and most everywhere those newer ones that are fenced and they have the you know seventy five bays or whatever. Right. You just drive up. You know, originally it was kept out of the industrial districts because they were pretty, um, you know, we went through a phase, I think, where they were really popular sort of um, fill in uses that could generate some income for a property until some other maybe better use came along. And we were concerned about eliminating the um, opportunities for economic development in our industrial districts. And so we um, didn't want them in the industrial districts. I mean, that shifted a little bit. We don't, I, there's not like a huge demand for these things, but I think just because of the type of use and the way they look and sort of where they're 
typically where they make sense to be located. Um, uh, that's why we're proposing this shift. And so, and <clears throat> for the record, this is not specific to marijuana, by the way, just so that it's not for storage of marijuana. Yeah. This is just another. <laughs> just, this is yeah, the reason why it's attached to this package is because we also wanted to add it to the OI table, right. and so we wanted those to come together. So the one we're le taking it out of one zone and putting it in another, and we are changing the OI table because of the marijuana production. So it just kind of snowballed. Anyone have any thoughts on relocating or <coughs> storage supply system, storage supply companies? Okay. Let's go on to the next one. This is also <clears throat> this is also actually not directly related to marijuana. This is an ordinance to reformat the uh, general industrial table and other minor changes. And that, actually, Carolyn, why don't you just um, why don't you just break it down for us? I okay. think that's better. Mm -hmm. So um, this table matches sort of the other tables we've been slowly um, um, changing. And at the same time, um, just to clarify what it means to be in the what it means for general industrial district, what kind of uses we um, want, sort of the layout of the setbacks, and then also because we need to take the um, use of production out of the definition section and move it into the table of use, we've taken the opportunity to do that here um, and add uh, this warehousing um, sort of. Um, use up to 25,000 square feet um, and then whenever we go into a table we look at any of the other issues that may have arisen over the years since the last time we've reviewed the district and try to make those changes all at once so that's why some of those other bits are in there as well any questions no, I jumped ahead earlier, so I'm all. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> not being punished. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's move on then. Um, okay, this is uh, 308, right? Uh, item 18.03. This is uh, to reformat the office industrial table and allow flexible reuse of historic mill buildings, which you're um, <clears throat> again, the reformatting, but also thinking, um, re so office industrial is a district on, that's not quite like general industrial, it doesn't have that sort of in, um, intense manufacturing contained. We, we've zoned a lot of the buildings that are the old mill buildings in the city are um, all, all zoned office industrial. Um, and so, there are several buildings that aren't, um, that are hard to reuse. Um, we've just had this new building, um, new old building come on market, the AP machine. A lot of people are looking at different ways to reuse that building. There, uh, and not just with that building, but many of these build, um, mill buildings have historic contamination issues, so they make it even more expensive to renovate and reinvest in. And so the idea in this change is to sort of think about, you know, why would it add other components to the uses that would um, help generate income that would offset those expenses that um, are required to um, rehab, update, um, reuse these buildings. Um, so allowing uh, more easily residential above the first floor. Um, so that um, two and three, four-story buildings could have potential, you know, either rental or condominium units, um, and then keep the ground floor as commercial use as we've always um, required in the office industrial. You know, we don't want to lose um, space uh, opportunities for uh, back office businesses or small manufacturing or startup companies. Um, but we also want to allow a little bit more flexibility into the mix to make that more economically viable. Included in this, of course, is marijuana production. Right. Well, that was already allowed right. in the industrial district, but we're just moving that from the definition section to the table of use, um, but also including restaurant use, um, 
um, some little bit of um, retail and um, repair service, things that we don't have it typically required or allowed in the industrial districts. We don't want to, we have lots of space for retail and those kind of functions in restaurants, of course. But there's, there's not an enormous inventory. We're not like Hoyoke in that respect. We don't have a, right. an enormous inventory of buildings um, predating 1939 that were built for such things. Uh, Councilor Klein and Council Murphy. I don't personally know what's involved in the production of marijuana, but I'm just wondering if these um, locations can kind of support what might be needed in terms of, I mean, I don't know how much kind of a fluvia there might be or how much water use and the, you know, how much the pipes will need to hold. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious about, um, you know, how much that's been thought about in terms of using old mill buildings for this for uh, production of marijuana. Um, we haven't thought about that in particular. So the marijuana production isn't just for the old mill buildings. It's for a any property. So there are other um, parcels in the city that are office industrial besides, you know, those pictures I showed there. Um, you know, there's some office industrial out on East Hampton Road. Um, so it's not just about recapturing the mill buildings. I'm just thinking about the difference in the infrastructure for a yeah. place like that versus an office industrial area, right. which I think would have more kind of updated and robust infrastructure, I would imagine. It could. Um, you know, we have some industrial district on East Hampton Road, and there's no sewer service there. So that's an issue for, you know, that area. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. but. You know, this is really just to sort of um, pull back some of the regulatory impediments to reusing the building, and then if someone, if you know, a potential um, producer or interested in looking at those buildings, obviously that's something they'd have to take into consideration. Most of these are served by water and sewer, so maybe the internal systems aren't um, up to code or, or robust enough to handle that, but. I would think that would be sort of that would be part of any kind of decision um, tree that's made to, as to whether it's a viable operation there. Oh, did I notice too that it is going to make it easier for some live work? Well, it's the uh, well, we already allow live work, but instead of tying live to um, work in the building, we're separating those. So I could go and live on the second floor of one of those buildings, but work downtown. Right now, the restriction is only live work, which means you have to live in the building. And, and the, initially, um, that idea was um, um, instituted to, to make sure that um, there weren't concerns or conflicts with nuisance, noise, smells of things coming out of the industrial portion of the building for people living in it because they, they work there, so they know what they're um, dealing with. And, I think it's just, it's hard to enforce. So this idea is really to say, all right, we're not going to make those, make a requirement that those are tied together. If someone wants to live in a building where there's other stuff going on on the first floor, they know that going in, they can make that decision. Mm -hmm. All the other, any, not only for marijuana production, but for also for a restaurant or for any other facility, it's a heavy lift. I mean, to 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 retrofit to accommodate the existing standing laws for restaurant safe structures, uh, cafes, clubs, uh, sprinkler systems, water, uh, energy. water capability, energy, any 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 of those systems. So it would apply to marijuana as well. Mm -hmm. In some respect, there's already a built-in limitation. There's a pretty pretty steep expense associated with trying to accommodate and retrofit these systems in order to accommodate them. But, and there are other statutes that, that address those. We have sprinkler requirements, for instance, certain capacity requirements and things like that. Um, what this does, actually, you're also, as you mentioned before, the issue of uh, solar photovoltaic um, no longer requires uh, a, site plan, a slight site review. Special permit, yes. Special permit and uh, also parking. You do the, yep. the, reduce the parking. So, um, and as you pointed out, the ones that we have, and I'm trying to think, I was, I, while you were talking about it, I was trying to think of any building in town that might have 
very limited parking as it stands now. The only thing I can come up with is the Felt Building, of course, right. which doesn't really have parking now, and they're currently parking down at the, at, at Alumni Field and stuff. But yeah. the only other um, building that's a bit constrained. Well, I guess you could, there's so one of the built one of the office industrial districts is it contains the mill building along the bike path in Poland Center. So there's there's parking along there, but it's um, you know long narrow section and then there's the non-attack mill one end of it That's is constrained by parking there's small parking lot around that end but they have another parcel across the way in fact they went to the planning board for special <coughs> permit to allow the use of the off essentially off-site parking to help support that building but so those are the two that i can think of that have sort of limited parking some questions um, are you kidding me? That's it. Okay. That's um, that's uh, it for and the. And I will the say the planning board um, voted unanimously to recommend. The whole okay. Patrick, did you want to speak? Yeah, I just wanted to speak in support of this change. Sure. Not quite enough. So. Okay. We'll share. Good evening, I'm Patrick Brown. I live in Ward 5. I'm also the Vice Chair for the City's Housing Partnership. I wanted to speak tonight in support of the change that's being discussed for the historic mill buildings, uh, particularly in support of the allowing residences above the first floor by right. With this, we're not looking at capital area affordable housing, but it helps with the supply and demand balance for housing generally in the city and how that will assist with affordability for housing by allowing additional units. Uh, the papers I'm handing out are speaking to general housing affordability in the city. And that looking compared to 1980, while the average income is still approximately 34,000, it's gone up like $2,000 in the last 30 years. The, the average cost of a new home went from $95,000 in 1980 to $311,000 now, so about three times the increase. And as a result, um, looking at 44% of Northampton rents and 50% of those renters are cost burden, meaning that they pay 30% or more in their housing costs. And of that group, half of that is severely cost burden, meaning they pay 50% or more in housing. And looking at homeowners, 20% of them are cost burden. So anything that we do to increase overall housing in the city will at least slow the growth of housing costs. And although this is a small piece, it's another piece that helps. And also appreciate that the ordinance as within doesn't increase the parking requirements. I couldn't find a direct study to speak to this particular case of when you have buildings that already exist that you allow certain uses in and then add residences later, but in general, if you're building a new building, adding parking requirements can drive up the cost of the unified 20%, at least, and it simply can impact any of the businesses who are adding, uh, adding to the list of allowed uses. So whatever we develop by not adding more stringent parking requirements is going to be more affordable to the end user, whether that's as a residence or as a business. And there's this ordinance, well, to me, kind of, when I read it, I imagine something like East Works in East Hampton. We have residences on the top floor and a variety of residences and down floor, uh, other floors. That's like a very promising model to look at. So thank you for the, to the planning department for bringing this forward. And I hope it gets adopted. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or discussion on the items as they were iterated? I'll accept the motion. Close the public hearing. Oh, yeah, sure. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. I, I maybe missed something because I'm not sure on process. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, it's okay. So I am interested in that map and that it includes Florence Center and thinking about um, 
whether we have options or whether this is preordained and whether I missed my opportunity to weigh in on um, how that Florence Center is developed and what's allowed to be there. A couple of my concerns are specific to the kind of neighborhood it is. We do have a lot of empty retail space. We have some struggling businesses. I can see how if we're not careful and thoughtful about how development goes forward that it could become a kind of default location for for you know a disproportionate number of places. So I wouldn't want it to be a destination for that, in part because it's, as you know, highly residential. Um, it's not too far from the middle school, and it's where all the middle schoolers, including one of my sons, goes on a Friday afternoon to wander the shops and get an ice cream or hang out at Cooper's. Um, and then also that getting back to the idea of you know what are the buffer zones. Another concern would be some of the housing that we have in the area that supports our residents who are struggling with addiction or unable to live on their own and kind of what the impact would be on them and their recovery. And then also places like uh, that you might think are akin to schools like you know hospitals or libraries or other places where we have different public interest around how the space is used. So those are the considerations that I'd hope to put forward. But I don't know if the map is done, you know. It's, well, to your point about preordained, no, yeah. this is government, nothing's preordained. Um, the fact is it is a process, and it's not necessarily a fast, elegant process by any stretch. Um, the advocate, whatever, whatever transpires today, whether, and if this gets referred with a positive recommendation, it gets voted and approved on the council floor, there are still opportunities to modify and change throughout forever, forever, uh, uh, within the limitations of mass general law, just to be clear. I mean, that, that stuff more or less, at least as far as we're concerned, is preordained. We, um, we would have to challenge in court anything that we found that, that if we were constrained by mass general law and it didn't serve us, we'd have to petition the state or sue them. Not a very successful operation as a rule, but <laughs> there you go. Um, so yeah, I mean, in, in so far, this is this is the recommendation. Is what you're saying? Um, it is in the end. <clears throat> it will. You know, I, I'm I'm not sure. I mean, I haven't heard any proposed amendments, but currently, this is a, as it stands. If amendments are brought forward by. Uh, um, by counselors or by petition or by the mayor, all the people who qualify to actually um, request modifications and changes, then it'll be considered changed if, if, it's, if there's a majority vote on it. All right, thank so you. There you go. And so who made the recommendations? This comes, these recommendations actually are essentially parallel, tied to, as, as Carolyn mentioned, they are trying to put in place what already exists in the process that we established uh, for regulating uh, medical marijuana. Right. So we're, we're obliged to do that. Um, and we are, um, and then if we're going to make specific recommendations, then that, that comes further for okay. the gun line. Also, given the fact that even, we still don't have the final version of what the state regulations are. That's part of a problem. I mean, we're sort of making things up slightly in the dark. We have much more, we have a much better idea about what their intents are, but um, as it stands now, we're, we're, what we need to do is to change this zoning before April 1st. Otherwise, actually there are no restrictions. There wouldn't be buffer zones applied. There wouldn't be, they wouldn't exist uh, because applications start going in. Whoever applies, whatever existing law that's standing on the statutes applies and they they don't need to conform to zone. They don't need. I mean, they don't need to conform to uh, the buffer zone. So, I imagine that the medical standards and guidelines only take us so far in terms of what's helpful and what makes sense, right? That that a medical establishment would have more the look and feel and function of a pharmacy, and the possibilities here for retail marijuana are for something a lot more festive. Right, with you know, with signs and access and an and impact on our street life. And so I ask you as a body to think ahead for most of us who either can't really see the map because it's so tiny <laughs> or aren't really sure what's happening in our town um, to consider in advance like what this is going to be like for people when they realize it's 
its effect on their neighborhood. Um, you know, I'm new to this process, and I appreciate very much this opportunity, and I appreciate your leadership in thinking about what it's going to be like when people actually see, you know, next door we have this, or down the street we have that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just two quick points. First, uh, signage is strictly controlled uh, under the state regulations. So uh, there won't be big marijuana leaves and flashing lights and, and things of that nature. And it's not going to look too different uh, than what the medical. It wouldn't conform to our zoning as it stands now. So it, 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 it's, it's not going to be uh, all that different. And uh, I, I guess the. <coughs> pardon me. Yeah. The other point is that uh, it's going to be a slow process, and the state is going to be vetting these individuals very closely. There's record checks, there's all sorts of things. So even what the town passes on, grants permits for, and executes host agreements for, the state still gets a second uh, uh, bite of the apple, so to speak, of regulating the individuals who are going to be operating these places. And, and this is a little off topic but could you describe the vetting process because uh, uh, there is embedded in that um, um, local impact or host impact uh, process and if you could explain what that is well the uh, the state statute that creates this the legal marijuana licensing process uh, says that in addition to any special permit relief that may be involved, in addition to these comprehensive state regulations, if the city or town feels that there's a need for further regulation of the use, those, uh, what are referred to in the statute as mutual responsibilities of both the, uh, uh, the applicant and the, uh, the licensee and the town can be spelled out in this host agreement. Uh, so that there's uh, plenty of places for local control and. Uh, obviously, the other significant aspect of this post agreement is giving the town the municipal sales tax over not just retail but the other facilities. The state law allows the retail sales tax right now uh, for allows the sales tax right now just for the retail end, but the host agreement allows a city or town to exact up to three percent for up to five years for these other types of uh, uses as well. And the the host permissions essentially can be. Uh, retail retailer specific sites it's, it's it's specific to any licensee so any licensee that is see, that once it obtains a special permit relief or other type of zoning relief then has to execute a host agreement with the executive of the town before their application will be deemed complete at the state level the state so level. red flags per retailer red flags that may come up during the process per retailer can be addressed by um, by the city one would assume that the state process would not happen in a vacuum right and that there would be some type of communication I but uh, I, I mean I think that, that you can't open whatever the town is even if the town is signed off with to host agreement with special permit relief and everything else the state didn't grant a license because there's some individual some personality some criminal record problems some fraud problems some uh, uh, enforcement actions and some other civil proceeding, which is part of what the, the background check process involves, uh, you don't get the license open uh, from the state if those problems exist. I don't know of any other enterprise that's regulated like that. So. Medical marijuana. Medical marijuana. <laughs> You're not suggesting, though, that the host agreement would be something that would be individualized for each different establishment, are you? Well, I, I, I think it's conceivable that different uses, a manufacturing use, a cultivation use, would have different impact, a different impact than a retail use. It's conceivable. But in other words, a host agreement for any retailer would look the same. Presumably. It's not like the you're statute going to build in different things for different locations. Unlike medical, locations or unlike medical, retail has very specific things that go into the host agreement. And so I would think that, that um, and I'm actually sort of trolling the state for any forms of host agreements right now. A lot of municipal lawyers are looking for them, not any that have responded to have any. So we don't really know exactly what they're gonna look like yet, but they'll be pretty uniform. But each, 
each retailer is going to have to enter into a host agreement and you know these are so and I, I just want to step back a little bit and, and make it clear to the, uh, the woman from Florence uh, this is just laying out a broad picture of where marijuana establishments can be located if if the, if the retailer can go through the rest of the process and get through and come out the other end these are the places that it could be so but there's a rigorous process to get out the other end and just because these areas are opened up to marijuana uses doesn't mean that they're going to be inundated with it with those uses because there's all these other processes to go through this is just sort of a broad like overview of the city and, and then we're going to have to zoom in on each location and each um, proposed retailer or can i just for um, clarification so in other words are you sort of saying that just in the sake of time and that that this is sort of just like a i mean why not do it thoughtfully from the start like so like i don't understand why we need a broad brush versus a more because that's what zoning is Zoning is a broad brush. Zoning is districts. Districts in which certain uses are allowed. And sometimes in zoning there are special permits required or site plan review required or other uses allowed as of right. But this is uh, sort of the, the, the aerial photo of the city. And it becomes much more difficult when you get to, this, to the particular retail or particular site. And, I and know so it's the same yeah. thing if this were any other retail. Mm -hmm. um, no one says um, liquor stores are allowed in these districts. Well, why don't we zoom in and do something more, more, um, more specific? This is zoning. This is zoning where districts have to be uniform. We separate the city into districts, and we have uniform uses that are allowed and not allowed in those districts. Mm -hmm. Now let's zoom in and figure out exactly who is going to do what where. Mm -hmm. But this is just zoning, mm -hmm. and so I don't want to. I don't want you to think that we can regulate that much further into the particular retailer in zoning. No, and I'm not asking you to, but I guess I'm just asking for a slightly more, you know, a less broad stroke. And I feel like that we do have that opportunity now. And, you know, that why, that, you know, to not include, you know, certain other categories, like this other person was saying with, with the, you know, the, hospitals or, or other things that you know we don't know I mean and and include more uh, less farmland than what is being allowed or you know I just think um, where you know this is new it's not alcohol it's and a lot of towns are doing special permits you know because we want to see what this is going to look like and have a little more control and you know and I know that the host agreements allow some some additional revenue and some additional you know controls and stuff but you know it gets really tricky too when you do things individual by individual and not like this is just what we want in our community this is our policy you know otherwise there can be a lot of unequal treatment and we did it for them we should do it for them and I don't know host agreements you know have a role but, but that's they're not host agreements we can't also. rely on host agreements to, to zone for us or to do other things for us but farmland yeah. isn't a district you know Farmland is in a district, and everything in that district has to be uniform. But we could say a certain size. You know, I mean, we, 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 there's a lot of things we can do, and it, I don't. I just don't want it to sound like we can't do those things. As a community, we can. Well, no, actually, no one said that. I'm okay. I'm trying to. Re I'm mm. trying to suggest that, of course, that. Can I'm just be. worried. Like this is all going to go through in a week, and it's a done thing. You know, unless I can get well, me, how many let signatures. Let me re <laughs> There are no done things. Uh, doesn't happen uh, the, the what is there is kind of a, what is critical is at least get our laws to conform and be, be compliant that's that's kind of that's the clock that's ticking uh, also the planning board relative to zoning is a discretionary board uh, particularly on, on site plan review they, they basically they take in the testimony of a community that feels it would be adversely impacted and try to assimilate that and make it work, but that's where the granular work is done that uh, uh, Councilor Seawalt is talking about. Mm -hmm. We are describing and defining the boundaries at this point, and mostly to comport with the law. <laughs> and then, and then, then the time comes, as we discuss, and uh, 
you know, when we data, when we grab data sets and, and, and figure out what the metrics are and figure out what the impacts are, mm -hmm. then we make then we make the adjustments and we legislate it. And it's constantly in flux. It's constantly fluid, at least within our limited powers and authorities that are granted to us by the state. Um, and some of that, mm -hmm. I mean, some of the things you ask actually is out of our out of our wheelhouse. I think so. Thanks. Any other thoughts, any comments? Oh, so there was a motion to close a public hearing. Is there a second? Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor of closing the public hearing, please say aye. 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 By closing the public hearing doesn't mean that we're done. We also have, I know you want to leave. Do you want to stay yeah. around for the taxi ordinance? Oh, if you want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah that would be helpful. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so close. I know. I saw everyone was, yeah. <laughs> um, I just say one, just one thing. Um, I just want to, I mean, in terms of growing, if people wanted to see what that was all about, they could go to the Medicare website and there's a tour of the facility in the And we've offered people if they wanted to go to for a trip, you're welcome to do that. <laughs> what? Oh, your city council van? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Yes. I said this to the folks. I'd like to Second. That was all the ones we yeah. 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 My reason for that is, you know, the time is of the essence in anything is to get this zoning of the books prior to April 1 so there isn't a free for all. I mean, this is the one thing, this is the one thing we got to act on with some haste so it isn't just wide open. But I think it's responsible to. Other thoughts on that? I agree. I agree. Um, okay, any other discussion? No? All those in favor with a, of a positive referral to the, to the council, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So now we're up to item 17.265. That's a smaller number than the ones we've been addressing. That's because this has been oh. around for a long time. <laughs> And uh, we have Council Shara here, also uh, Solicitor Seawald, and then of course uh, Council Murphy, who is our legacy here for. Uh, our, our I'd like to move we refer this back to the city <laughs> services. <laughs> <laughs> you were going to get stabbed. Yeah, I don't have a warm. I not get a warm fuzzy feeling for that. <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> um, actually, uh, I, uh, rather than read through all these, I would. You, part, of, part of the problem, we, we punted on this last time because actually Councilor Murphy was not here. Councilor Sherrill was not able to show up and, and I had given uh, the solicitor from showing up. And we realized we didn't know, we, were, we didn't know about the granular historical arc on this. So we didn't even know, I mean, we, we have not seen, we didn't get tracking. Uh, it's been carbon dated, that's yeah. all. Well, okay. So if, if, uh, if, if, Councilor Shara or, or Solicitor Seawall would like to just sort of give us an overview about what we're looking at here and why. You feel like you feel up to that? Be my guest. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to do more hearings on this than I have. Well, so the last time we were all together to discuss this, um, uh, John Fry, the Sealer Ways and Measures, brought up a couple points that hadn't been um, talked about before. And that is what led us to review this again. So his two main concerns were, at, to refresh your memory, we had this, the new ordinance or the change had been to go away from hardwired mirrors. Um, no, there had, we, it had been hardwired mirrors that were never used. It had to say, it put them in and said that's what we were gonna use or to use an app because this is what's done all over with Uber and Lyft and successfully. His concern, and this is his specialty, is that the margin of error for the app was um, too large for comfort for him. And his other concern was that 
we um, there some of the users that um, uh, that he was concerned about are particularly elderly or people who have established relationships with taxis where they have sort of a set rate that they use and it may be a reduced rate um, they've used forever they have an agreement and he was worried that this was going to impact them and that they would no longer be able to get the services that they really needed um, in a way that they, they could afford. So he met with Chief Casper and um, together they worked on a few changes. And so what we have, uh, what they've gone to is that um, we are back to sort of what had been done in practice, which is that there will not be uh, meters or you won't need to use an app. Um, the companies will agree on on a rate um, and it will need to be posted. And, um, and if they want to hardwire a meter, they can, but that apps will not be written into the ordinance. Um, and they will have to post their fares. Um, the other thing that um, they notice was missing was that we um, we hadn't sort of figured out how to handle companies that were um, weren't licensed here in Northampton but were licensed elsewhere. So they've added in there that you can pick up or drop off a fare in Northampton but you can't do both. So an outside company that's not licensed here can't come in and pick someone up and then drop them within Northampton. They could pick someone up um, and drop them here or uh, elsewhere but only Northampton licensed companies can do the entire trip with it. And they also can't do a flag, right? They can't be right and, right, here. and they can't be flagged. Can't be built. Correct. So those are the latest changes on this. Um, and Mr. Seawald, you you looked at it. I did. Um, I thought the the changes were thoughtful. Uh, I mean, I hadn't done any independent research on what taxi ordinances look, else, look like elsewhere. But I remember when we were at, at um, this committee, I believe, last year. <laughs> Different um, committee. You know, we, there was a, a decision made not to regulate out of town cabs. Uh, and um, so that is another thing that's changed. I think that the, just to, to get back behind where we were before John got involved, and expressed his concerns to the uh, police chief. Um, one of the cab company's uh, owners complained that uh, he seemed to be the only one who was actually running on taxi plates and everybody else was doing livery plates and it's a lot cheaper to run a livery. The, the insurance rates are much lower of this, you know, it's, it's just much cheaper and easier to run a livery, but they were operating as taxis. That's what prompted this whole process to get started. And of course, as, as always, the, the devil's always in the details. It was a great, you know, it seemed like a great idea, but the further we went, the more the devil emerged. And so I think that we have crafted a much better ordinance now. Um, and, um, and I think that John's suggestions were good ones and not something that I would have thought of that they were elderly people in the city who have long standing relationships with cab companies and take them to their you know, every two week doctor's appointment or, you know, whatever it is, but they have standing arrangements with cab companies that would be uh, upended by this new ordinance. So that's how we got to where we are. That's right. Oh, and just in the end, um, the last time this came up in, in front of the previous committee, that's when John came forward and Chief Casper is the sponsor. The two of them agreed, we continuing to the new session, they would go and put their heads together and then reintroduce what we have in front of us uh, based on John's feedback. So that's kind of why it didn't get acted on in the last session, but now it's come back. The chief is the sponsor with John's input. This hopefully is the final version. Right, and I, th I think it still accomplishes the goal of making a distinction between taxis and the And the reason. And can you describe how that happens on this? Because that was in the original iteration, right? addressing the livery versus taxi licenses. So what the distinctions yeah, are? Yeah, how, how the distinctions are more clarified here. And, because that's not in the amended language that we currently have. Um, Is it just the limitation of outside cab companies? And that 
because yes. we have we have local companies that are running livery vehicles, right? Right. So the definition does in the beginning of the ordinance it does say taxis and then right. livery it's, vehicles and specifies the fifteen passengers. And right. Right. But that's right. existing language, isn't it? Currently, the definition of livery versus taxi. The whole thing is a new draft. I mean, there's some new bits in all of it, but if you look under uh, subsection 316-19, operation and marketing of livery vehicles, there's a whole section on sort of the distinction of livery vehicles. Okay, and, that, and that's new language? Just new. I think it just doesn't I don't have, like, right. my all my past copies. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wasn't expecting to be speaking to this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I really didn't. I should have brought my, my I forgot to bring my giant folder with God, many, uh, many, 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 many versions. And Councilor um, you've, been, you've been involved with this in terms of parking. Well. I, I think we added the livery definition. I, okay. That is new. It just doesn't show. I think what you see here are the amendments. The amendments. Right. That's what I'm saying. That's the only version we have. So, so we don't know. So, so, so yeah. what I think that what this ordinance now does is to prohibit livery livery vehicles from picking up on-demand fares mm -hmm. and any other fare that was not arranged more than 12 hours yeah. before the ride. So cabs can are are Good fluid. Point, yeah. Livery is more like uh, the airport. Right. Air, transporters. Uh, yeah. Transporters. Yeah. No, transporters. Yeah. So you should have the entire ordinance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. I mean, okay. yeah. here's my problem: is that I right now. The only, I only see the paragraphs at the bottom here that are amended, and then I, so I didn't know, mm -hmm. okay. that for compare and contrast purposes, what improvements and enhances have we made from the original document? It's in your paper packet. From the original? Well, the, mm -hmm. we, never, we don't have the original. What we have is the, um, yeah. the one that was submitted by, the one that was submitted by the police, and that went through a number of amendments right. over the course of time, mm -hmm. and doesn't show all those amendments, only shows this right. most recent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so the, uh, right. that's. Yes. I'm fine with that. I'm not, I'm not contesting it. I just want to be clear. I understand. So that I don't appear dumber than usual. And, yeah, and the, the bottom line problem that will still remain is enforcement of the dis of the difference between the cab and and the livery vehicle, because we could have a licensed livery vehicle that keeps behaving like a cab. The question is, you know, do the police take the time to deal with it and right. say you can't, you know, the ordinance may say what the ordinance says, but at some point they've got to go and actually yeah. enforce it. And I don't know to what extent, you know, it's like our dealings in the old days with the engine brakes. We can put the signs up, but if they don't enforce it. It's my understanding that having a clear ordinance will help them. Will help them that, if that they choose to. Yeah. That was one of the reasons it's hard to enforce. Yeah, it's a complaint. Yeah, it's right. a complaint. But at least they'll have the like capacity. We're, to we're never going to know when the passenger in a livery vehicle called and arranged right. the ride. I yeah. mean, that's just unless it's complaint driven and be interesting to see. You would have to actually pull them over, ask the person in the back whether you call twelve hours before that. But okay, but it is. It, it does. It. It provides some nuance where a nuance did not exist before. A little right. framework for them to enforce if they want to. Although to the point you just said, for livery they're required to have um, like a written a log. log. Yeah. So that should be recorded okay. and you'd be able to see if they had called it. Um, any other questions? Or I, I mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think this is, is clear. I wish I could remember the original. I do. I actually remember discussing the original years ago. And for some reason, I didn't retain it all. I don't know what's the matter with it. But, um, bump it to next session. <laughs> no, no. I, I, uh, I will accept a. I would move. We. I would move it to council with a positive recommendation, hoping not to see it again for a while. <laughs> Was that a second? Uh, council Klein seconds. Any discussion on the positive referral to city council? Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? I'll accept the motion to adjourn. To adjourn. Okay. So, all those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. Thank you all very much.